for the word this morning. Come on. I'm really, really excited. Uh, the title of my message this morning is Small Things, Big Difference. Everyone say small things. Big difference. There are small things in life that can make a big difference. But before we dive in, let's pray. Father, I just thank you, God, for the small things that make a big difference in our world. And that, God, you want to speak to us and encourage us and plant faith on the inside of our hearts this morning. And so, Lord, we open our hearts, our lives to you. Lord, to come and to have your way. Thank you that you're already here. Now may we hear your voice speaking to each one of us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. Fantastic. Small things make a very big difference. Just ask anyone who's ever had a toothache before. Or anyone like we had when we were moving house. We had to drive about three hours to our new house. The truck had gone ahead. We packed up the car, got the family in the car, and we started heading down the road. Five minutes later, there was this huge grinding sound coming from the car. And it was this, a stone, a very small stone stuck in the brake pads. How many of you know a small stone can make a big difference when it gets jammed in your brake pads? Uh, who remembers computers? I don't. We know they, they would fill a room. They were so big. They were like this. They would fill an entire room. And that was just one computer until the invention of a very small thing called the microchip, which has changed everything, hasn't it? So small things can make a big difference. And of course, a small seed can grow into a very large tree. God has placed the principle in creation itself that small things can make a very big difference in our lives, in our world. And the Bible itself is full of small things making a big difference. Just think of David. Remember with one small stone, he took out Goliath. He made a big difference that day for the armies of Israel when he took out Goliath with that small stone, with a small army, Gideon. He took on the Midianites, this terrible army that were traumatizing and constantly coming and attacking the Israelites. With a small army, he routed them and made a big difference. Jesus himself, with a small boy's lunch, made a big difference the day he fed a crowd of 5,000 plus women and children. And then he said this, listen, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven. The realm of God is like, it comes to us like a seed. Something so small, but that expands and makes a huge difference both in our lives and in the world around us. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. The kingdom comes small, but makes a big difference. And God says in Zechariah 4 verse 10, our key verse is, Who dares despise the day of small things. Who dares despise the day of small, don't despise the small things. So often we're wired in our culture to look at the big and the spectacular and the amazing and, and it just gotta, it's just got to get more amazing and more wow and every movie that comes out has to have greater special effects and it has to sort of do more to wow us and we're always looking to the spectacular and the big. But God is focused on the small that ultimately makes the biggest difference. And so over the next few Sundays, at least when I am speaking, I want to continue this theme about small things making a big difference. And I want to look at a few small things in our lives that make a big difference. And I want to start off this morning by talking about our thoughts. Small thoughts make a big difference. Everyone say, our thoughts. My goal is to get inside your head today, okay? I'm going to get in the inside of your head if it's the last thing I do this morning. See, our thoughts are powerful because our thoughts become what? Become actions. By the way, you can follow along in the back of your newsletter here. Our thoughts become actions that become habits that ultimately determine our lifestyle and we reap a destiny from that. And it all starts with how we're thinking. What kind of thoughts are we entertaining? What is the focus of our thoughts? It all begins there. Did you know that you, you think an average of 30,000 thoughts a day? 
What number are you up to so far? <laughs> How are you going, Shoshan? You up to about number 10,000, 11,000? Yeah, I'll give you a few more if you like. We think about 30,000 thoughts a day. That's a whole lot of thoughts, isn't it? That's a whole pile of thoughts. Where are they heading? What direction are they going? Or is it just kind of floating through there uh, and, and you're not really thinking about your thoughts? I think that's most of us, isn't it? We don't really pay much attention to what's going on in that grey matter. But our thoughts are powerful. Who sort of Carolyn Leaf? She's an incredible woman of God. But more than that, she, well, more than that, she's also a neuroscientist. She's written books and uh, she's a Christian neuroscientist. She's a brain scientist and she's very experienced in her field. And listen to what she says. She says, if you realized how powerful your thoughts are, you would never think a negative thought. Now, she's not saying this from the point of view of a counselor. Come on, just think positive. She's, she's saying this from the point of view of a brain scientist, a neuroscientist, someone who looks at that gray matter and says, this is what happens physically in your brain when you have a negative thought. We weren't made for it. In fact, she goes on to say this. Thoughts are real physical things that occupy mental real estate. Moment by moment, every day, you are changing the structure of your brain through your thinking. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? In fact, my understanding is that this is fairly recent breakthrough that we used to think we were just victims of whatever our brain, however our brain was wired. If our, my father was an alcoholic, I'm probably going to be an alcoholic because my brain is just kind of wired through my DNA and whatever's up there is just going to determine how my life goes. But they're discovering in science now, no, 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 that's not the truth. Our brains actually change and mold. And, and, and shift according to the thoughts that we allow in. The thoughts that we entertain can literally change our brain structure. Is that amazing to anyone else? Yeah. Am I might just the only one here who's kind of like, wow, that kind of stuff. Let's go to the Bible. Psalm 10 verse 4 says, In his pride the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts there is no room for God. So saying someone living without God, since there's no room in their thoughts for God. And here's my first big thought for today is our thoughts can move us away from God and all that he has for us. Or our thoughts can actually move us toward God and all that he has for our lives. It's our thoughts that can do it. And I want to prove it in the Gospels too to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Turn there real quick. I want to show you two stories where these two polarized uh, things can happen. Matthew chapter 9 verse 2, it says, Some men brought to Jesus a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. And verse 4 says, knowing their thoughts. Everyone say, knowing their thoughts. Knowing their thoughts. knowing their thoughts. Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk. And the guy gets up and he walks out. But Jesus was pulling something up. I just love the fact that Jesus can mind read. Yes. Because my Bible says whatever he did, we can do too. <laughs> told you I'm going to get inside your head but these guys the Pharisees the religious leaders what were they doing they were entertaining evil thoughts what are evil thoughts those that oppose the will of God those that aren't in line with, with the order of how God has made the universe with who he is and his character they were entertaining evil they were, they were pointing to the son of God and in their hearts and their thoughts they were thinking he's blaspheming what were they doing? Their thoughts were cutting themselves off. They were resisting and undermining God moving in their world. And if you know, if we start thinking, oh, God can't do that for me. Oh, he did it for Phil, but he's not going to do it for me. If we start thinking thoughts opposed to how God is, that we literally can sabotage God moving in our world. Are you with me? Literally, our thoughts can separate us from the Lord. He doesn't go anywhere. He promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm, as clo I'm closer than a brother. But our thoughts, we can distance ourselves and ultimately miss out 
on all the good things God wants to put in our lives. I wonder what your thoughts are doing. Let's jump down a few verses, still in Matthew chapter 9. In verse 20 it says, jumping into another story, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only, she said to herself, if only I can touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned to her, said, take heart, daughter. He said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Did you notice what it says there? She said to herself. It all started right here. Everyone else was pressing and everyone else was touching Jesus' cloak, but they weren't getting the miracle. But this little old lady who had been subject to bleeding for years, been to doctor after doctor, was exhausted and exasperated, pressed through the crowd and said to herself, she was driven along by nothing else but her thoughts. It was her thought life that was pushing through that crowd. Because she thought to herself, if I can just reach Jesus, I know I can be healed. I know it. See, our faith, as much as it can push us away from God and, and block us out of what God wants to do in our lives, it can also pull us towards Him. And it can actually create faith in our hearts to open us to receive all the good things God has for us. Are you with me today? It's our thoughts. They are powerful. Our thoughts can move us away from God. They can move us towards Him and what He wants for us. If we sit around thinking, oh, God can't provide for me. Oh, God, you know, He can't heal me. Oh, God can't fix this mess. Oh, I'm too bad for God. We entertain thoughts that aren't in line with this, aren't in line with who He is. We can entertain those. God gives us free will and free choice, but we're choosing to block ourselves out from the best that God has. And ultimately, that is the definition of hell. Is a thought, someone who, the wicked man, has no room for thoughts about God in his world. That is the definition of hell. Proverbs 23, verse 7, in the New King James Version, says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man or a person thinks in his heart, so is he. As we think, so we are. Or I like to put it this way. Wait, your life will move in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Your life will move in the direction of your strongest thoughts. I'm not just to say, you know, if you have some random thought that your life is now over. It's the strong thoughts. It's those dominant thoughts that just keep reoccurring and popping up in your head time after time. The thoughts that kind of have emotion attached to them. Those thoughts are the ones that will drive us and ultimately direct our lives. So in your life, if your strongest thoughts are around fear, then you won't take risk or seize opportunities because what if? What if? That's what fear says. Is it what if? What if this terrible thing happens? If your strongest thoughts are of rejection, you're going to really struggle to build friendships, make connections with other people because your thoughts are self-rejecting. If your thoughts, on the other hand, are that God is with you, and that God is for you, if those are your strongest thoughts, how many of you know you're going to begin to experience more of His presence in your world? You're going to begin to feel the presence of God. You're going to begin to experience the power of God working in your life when we entertain <coughs> thoughts that, hey, my God is with me. My God is for me. My God is, His grace is sufficient for me. What are your strongest thoughts? In fact, I want to encourage you this morning to think about what you think about. Can we do that for a moment? Come on, I want you to turn to the back end news leader. I want you to think about what you think about. And I've got a scale here and just three kind of polarizing thoughts that we can be entertaining. And the first one up there is between worry and peaceful. And I want you to think about this before you write a number. I just want to just talk around these briefly. See, are you a worrier or are you walking in the peace of God? Are you worried? Are you constantly worrying about your kids, worrying about the future, worrying about your finances, worrying about whatever there is to worry about? You just like to worry. Any worriers? Any self-confessed worriers in the house? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. We're all, we can all have that tendency. But are you a worrier or do you walk in peace? 
where even if all hell breaks loose, you just have this rock steady confidence and and who God is and what He's promised, and, and it just doesn't even affect you. You just you're just happy. You're able to comfort others when when trials come because you're just walking in, in real confident peace. Where would you be on that scale? Go ahead and just put yourself somewhere between zero and ten uh, on that scale between worry and peace because you can't be both at the same time. But we're all somewhere, I guess, in between. Are you negative or positive? Are most of the thoughts that go through your mind, are they kind of negative? Are they kind of down? Are they always kind of expecting the worst? It's going to rain today. Uh, I just know it's going to be a bad day. I just know things are going to turn out bad. I just know I'm going to fail that assignment. I just know my boss is going to be mad. I mean, just kind of expecting the worst all the time. And just kind of always negative. I bet the car's going to break down. Or I bet my wife is going to cost like $1,000. I bet, ah. Always just negative, negative, negative. Always able to have... The, I think some people actually have the spiritual gift of negativity. It's like they can just kind of scan and just find the negative. And it could be a beautiful, sun-shining day. And they'll be like, yeah, but... <laughs> Yeah, but <laughs> always find something wrong. Or are you at the other end of the scale? You're just a super positive person. You just wake up in the morning, you spring out of bed. Woo! All right, here we go. Let the day begin. Woohoo! And your thoughts are just filled with this is going to be a great day. Man, I'm going to rip through that assignment. My boss is going to be so pleased with me. Man, my kids are awesome. I am awesome. God is awesome. Everything is awesome. <laughs> Is that how you start your day? Is that how you live your day? Is it in a a, a positive mindset, a positive frame of thinking, or is it more towards the negative? Go ahead and just put somewhere on that scale. Just think about it. A bit of self-assessment, a bit of uh, auditing of your own thoughts. Are you negative or positive? And the last one is worldly or eternal. Worldly or eternal. Uh, Worldly is just, are your thoughts more consumed about just stuff? You know, just money. What am I going to wear? What do people think about me? Where, what do I think of me? You know, these kinds of things, you know, that, that thing you're wanting to buy, just constantly thinking about that thing, you know, it's coming up on trade, you know, what a bit, you know. And, and, and not, these things aren't bad things, but, but our, our minds can be just consumed with just constantly just temporary things, worldly things, the stuff of this world, and, and just got to, you know, make it through this world and get things going. Or are you more on the eternal mindset where you're thinking about, now what's God's will for me today? What does God want for me? I know I've got to get this and that done, but how can I help somebody else? How has God called me to, to touch someone else's life? How can I use my money to, to give to someone else who might be in need right now, rather than just worldly thinking, oh, this is how much I've got, how can I maximize, you know, get a good bargain here, but thinking, how can I use my finances to build the kingdom to help somebody else? Go ahead and just sort of put on the scale there whether you're kind of more generally on the, no, no one's going to look at, look at your score chart. No one's going to, you don't, I'm not going to make you hand it in. This is self-assessment time, people. Are you more towards the worldly side or more towards the eternal side? Where are you somewhere on that scale? Go ahead and just fill that one in. And then turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, sorry, verses 4. Because I am already banking that unless, I'm banking that no one got 30 out of 30. In fact, could someone please own up right now? If you got 30 out of 30, is there anyone in the house this morning? So I'm going to give you the mic. (laughs) I'm guessing that none of us are walking in perfect peace, constantly positive, and always eternally minded in every moment. And if that's the case, then we've all got some room to improve. I mean, we've all got some room to improve. In our thought life, let's think about what we think about. But how do we change our thoughts? How do we rewire our brain? How do we restructure? How do we do what Paul says in Romans 12 too, to the renewing of your mind? Be transformed by the renewing of our mind because we always come to Christ and we still have our old ideas, our old thoughts, and they pop up from time to time. And we've got to root some of those out and put some good ones in. How do we do this? Can I give you some practical tools this morning? Two Corinthians chapter ten verse. I'm gonna read verses four and five. I think just verse five is on your sheet. The weapons we fight with. Don't you love that? Christianity is a fight. I hate it when people say, "Oh, Christianity is for pansies, for girls." It's a fight. And we've got weapons. 
Come on. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. They're not natural, they're not carnal, it's not flesh and blood. On the contrary, they have divine power. Everyone say divine power. You are divinely empowered. They have divine power to demolish, annihilate strongholds. What are strongholds? Are thought patterns. Those negative thought patterns we can get stuck in. We have divine power to demolish those thought patterns, those strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive. Everyone say take captive. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Man, I love how Paul talks. I love it. How do we change? Number one, we capture destructive thoughts. We've got to get in the habit of this. As believers, this is really important. We've, I've already looked at it. Our thoughts can push us away from God or draw us to Him. We need to capture destructive, negative thoughts in our world. I love what Bill Johnson says. He says, I can't afford to have a thought about me that God doesn't have about me. I cannot afford to have a thought in my head about me that is not in God's head about me. Because how many of you know, if it's between me and God, he's usually right. I say usually, because he's still working on me. But I love the language that Paul uses. He says, take captive. That word in the Greek literally means to gain control over. To gain control over. Like jump out, boom! Grab that thing, throw some handcuffs on it, take it captive. It's kind of fairly violent kind of talk, not just kind of like, oh, well, that's a naughty thought, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) He doesn't say shoo it away, he says take it captive. Pull it out and say, who are you? You are wrong. You're an illegal alien. You do not belong here in my head. (laughs) Get out of my head now. We've got to take captive our thoughts to gain control over thoughts of worry, of fear, of discouragement. As pastors, we have a thing called Mondayitis. <laughs> pastors everywhere, all over the, the planet, wake up on Monday morning, discouraged, and the enemy piling thoughts. Oh, I'm a terrible person. Oh, my message was horrible. No one got it out of anything out of it. Oh, woe is me. I'm a terrible pastor. And get all kinds of discouraging thoughts. It's like a thing. It's like an assault of the enemy. It's called Mondayitis. Pray for me on Mondays. <laughs> and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. <laughs> And I know on Monday mornings, I've got to wake up and I've got to get ready. I've got to get in in the right stance. Like Paul says later on, he says, you've got to stand against the works of the enemy. Recognize where they're coming from. And when those thoughts come in and and, and they're negative or they're discouraging or or just trying to sap my energy, I've got to grab those things and put handcuffs on them and say, boy, you you do not belong in my head. Get out. We've got to take captive of those negative thoughts. What are the negative thoughts that float through your gray matter that you just kind of let just kind of sit there? See, we, we like that. It kind of feels good in our flesh sometimes. You know, Monday I just can have nothing to sort of wallow in those kind of self-pity thoughts. And, oh, no, whatever it is. I'm a terrible pastor. Nobody likes me. I'm going to make a garden to eat worms. And I can enter in this, and my flesh can feel so good and justified. That's right. Poor right. There, there. Nobody likes you. And, and, and we can have these thoughts, can't we? They're real. And if we're honest, it's not just me, it's all of us. And they're going to take any time. And someone could say something and, and we take it personally. And it's, like, it's about how I look or, you know, about my personality or something that I said. And, and we can get all kind of sensitive about it. We allow those thoughts to come in. And instead of just allowing them to come in and, and assigning truth label to them, I think we can so often like that. We're just like, truth, come on in. That's a lie of the devil. It's, no, you go, no, or you, get out. Get out. I love how, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Elite, um, no, um, oh, never mind. He used to say, you got to spank your brain. you got to spank your brain. Can I give you another Carolyn Leaf quote around this thing of taking captive negative thoughts? She says, when you objectively observe your own thinking, you think about what you think about. When you do this with the view to capturing rogue thoughts, you stop the negative impact and rewire healthy circuits into your brain. And that's from a brain scientist. It's pretty cool. I've seen the pictures. It's amazing that they take pictures of your brain. And I want to say this before we move on to point number two, is that not every thought in your head is yours. 
Not every thought that comes through your brainwave between your two ears is your thought. A lot of them are. 30,000 of them are. But not all of them are actually your thoughts. Because what's one of the names for our enemy in the Bible? Jesus calls him the father of lies. The father of lies. Sometimes we think of spiritual warfare as like, ah, demons frothing at the mouth, you know. But actually, although that does happen, the way demons most often operate, the way the devil, his main battleground, if you like, the weapons of his warfare are thoughts. He'll implant thoughts in your head. He'll allow thoughts. He'll create environments around your head of fear, of, of discouragement, of, of anger, of lust, whatever it is. And these thoughts begin to consume you. And it's like you, you can kind of get in a daze and a bubble of these things. And the enemy just pounds you with these negative thoughts. That's where he attacks. And here's the thing is he turns them around and he makes them think that they're your thoughts. Because they happened in your head, we just automatically think that, well, they were my thoughts. No. He's the father of lies. He implants lies about you, about who God is, about what other people think about you, about your future, about um, uh, God, what God is or isn't going to do in your life. He will lie about you to you about anything under the sun as long as he can undermine you and pull you away from God and his promises. So not every thought that goes through your head comes from you. First, we've got to capture destructive thoughts. And then Paul says this, we've got to make them obedient to Christ. In other words, tell yourself the truth. Everyone say, tell, tell yourself the truth. <laughs> tell yourself the truth. It's an amazing, eh? Amazing thing. We've got to talk to ourselves. The, the Bible constantly, you look at David in the Psalms, he's constantly talking to himself. Permission to talk to yourself. Let them think you're crazy. Talk to yourself. Because sometimes we need to talk to ourselves. We need to tell ourselves the truth. To root out those negative thoughts and tell ourselves the truth. And the truth will set us free. The truth will set us free. Freedom. freedom. Man, it feels good. And when we get into the practice of it, because here's the thing. Christianity starts off kind of like in a positional thing. We've been given everything through Christ. We have the kingdom in us. There's peace, there's joy, there's love. But then we learn to not just know the truth. But as we learn to get the truth from here to here, we begin to feel the truth. And so instead of just telling ourselves, it's okay, God is going to provide, it's okay, da 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 da, God will look after me, instead of having to tell ourselves, but our emotions are still going that way. If we do this enough, if we keep telling ourselves the truth, we'll begin to feel the truth. And then when we're in those situations where the enemy tries to come in or situations get a little bit rocky, we're still going to walk in that peace that God wants us to walk in. Are you with me? I have a morning mantra. I've said this uh, before. But every morning I wake up, I have a morning mantra. I go for a walk with the Lord and I talk. I just pretend I'm talking to the birds. <laughs> People drive past and see me. Ivan drives past and look at that nutter. <laughs> Actually, a lot of them kind of cross the other side of the road and walk on the other side because I often wear a green hoodie right over my head like this, walking around talking to myself. <laughs> that pastor is gone. <laughs> but I have a morning mantra. I tell myself every morning, I tell myself this. First of all, I thank God for the day. And then I do this. I say, thank you, Father, that you have lavished your love upon me. This is all from Scripture. You have lavished your love upon me. Your love defines me today. I am a loved child of God. That's who I am. Mm. How many of you know sometimes you wake up in the morning, you don't feel much like that? In fact, most mornings, how many of us feel like, I'm a loved child of God? No, we've got to tell ourselves the truth. Even before the enemy can get in there, ha! Huh? I've already filled my mind with the truth, devil. I'm a loved child of God. That's who I am. My God is for me. Who can be against me? No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. God is working all things together for my good and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I face today from a position of strength, not weakness. I am uh, strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. I am filled with power with the Spirit of the Lord to bring heaven wherever I go today. Amen. Welcome to the morning. That's my hello to the Lord in the morning. And I've learned it because I know if I just rely on my brain to feed it to me, it won't. It feeds me all kinds of junk from the previous day, stuff that's happened, the fight I had with my wife. The pre it just has all kinds of things it wants to tell me about, what my kids aren't doing, and you know what I've got on that day. My brain just feeds me rubbish, absolute rubbish. 
I've got to fill it up with the truth. Yeah. Tell myself the truth. Yeah. And that's a great way to start your day. Get a morning mantra or I'll email your mind. I'll tell you what, sometimes we can just be one thought away from freedom. Yeah. I tell you what, sometimes I get up, I don't want to get up. My brain's feeding me all kinds of things. You know, all kinds of negative stuff. And so-and-so did that. Email. <laughs> Just being honest. But then when I step outside and I just start telling myself, the Father has lavished his love. Thank you, Father, for your love. Your love defines me today. I'm a loved child of God. As soon as I start taking, it's like taking a fresh breath. It's like, wow, I didn't even realize I was under that. I didn't even realize. I was just, I was, my brain was fried before I even started the day. But man, now my mind is getting renewed just with the morning mantra. <laughs> See, I believe you'll always find what you're looking for. Bono from you too might not have, but the rest of us will find what we're looking for. Pictures like birds. You see those New Zealand hawks? Where do you see them? You usually see them in the middle of the road, right? Hanging on to some dead possum. And it's like you drive, you kind of slow down, you think it's not going to fly away. It's like the last second, it kind of leaves. But what are they, they're carrying birds, these, these hawks, they. They like dead things. And so they're always looking for dead stuff. Uh, as opposed to a tui. We get tuis in the flax bushes next to our house. And they're always looking for that sweet nectar, aren't they? They're always singing their song, looking for that sweet nectar, singing their song, looking for that sweet nectar. And it's the same with our thoughts. See, our thoughts can be programmed. We can always be, there's always dead things to find, amen? If you're looking for them, you'll find them. Dead things to dwell on. But if you're looking for the sweet things, the good things in life, man, you will find them. Let's be twoies for Jesus, amen? Do I have any twoies in the house? Sing the sweet song, come on. Think about what you think about. And this is why I think Paul says in Philippians 4.8, I want you to read this this week, Philippians 4.8, he talks about what to think about. He says, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Why? Because Paul knows. Paul understands something. There's power in our thoughts. Our lives move in the direction of our strongest thoughts. So what do you think about? And how can you begin to think on purpose rather than just whatever floats through there? I want to give you some super thoughts this morning. Can I give you three quick super thoughts to feed your brain? How about this one? I'm fully known and fully loved. I love this one. I've had so many moments in my life changed by this one. I can be driving along, feeling stink about something or something's going on, and I just stop and I just tell myself, I am fully known and fully loved right now in this moment. And it can just change the atmosphere around you right there. Everyone say, I am fully known and fully loved. Say it again, I'm fully known and fully loved. One more time, I am fully known and fully loved. Is that awesome? You are. Here's number two. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I just can't get away from this one. Philippians 4. It's such a powerful one. Paul, Paul's talking about any situation, whatever he finds himself, whether he's got lots or got little, whether he's hungry or full. He just says, man, you know, I've learned the secret of contentment and it's right here. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Everyone say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And again, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One more time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And here's another one. God in me isn't worried, so neither will I be. And if you know, God is never worried. He's never sitting on his throne, pulling out his hair, chewing his fingernails. Oh no. What's Kim Jong Un done today? <laughs> What's Donald Trump up to? Oh no, he's ruined everything. <laughs> what have they done today? Oh, they've screwed up their kids for life now. Oh dear, such good plans for them, but now break them. <laughs> Terrible parents. God is never like that. He's he's the rock of ages. He's the beginning from the end, the Alpha and Omega. He's got all things. He's sovereign over all of history. And he knows he's going to win. He's confident of it. 
He's not ever worried. He knows he's won. And he's won you and me back even though we've disobeyed. He's already paid the price. He provided his own solution through the cross, sending his son. And so now he is at peace. Who is that? Inner peace. Kung Fu Panda. Inner peace. But it's not some worldly inner peace we've got to find by emptying ourselves. No, I don't think we're, it's not, it's not, we've got to get filled with Christ. See, because the Bible says the greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. God took up residence on the inside of you. So if God in me isn't worried, neither will I be. When something comes along and threatens to worry you, just tell yourself this. But let's say it now. You're going to say, God in me isn't worried. So neither will I be. And again, God in me isn't worried. So neither will I be. One more time. God in me isn't worried. So neither will I be. Does that feel good? He's not worried about that thing going on, that relationship, financial situation, that bill he got to pay. He's not worried. So why should I be worried? I'm his child. Amen? <laughs> but you put down your Bibles and just stand to your feet where you are. And Trisha, can you jump on the keys? Someone get out something out of the word this morning? I want to pray a few things over you as we go. Have a quick stretch. And why don't you just close your eyes and focus on the Lord? Let's focus on Him right now. Come, Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, We have the mind of Christ. We have His thoughts. We have His mind. So this morning, I bless each one of you to possess the mind of Christ. I bless you right now to possess the mind of Christ. I dismiss stinking thinking. And I bless you to receive the mind of Christ that is at peace, that is confident, has the answers. You have the mind of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, which includes your mind and body, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, I bless your mind to be sanctified and cleansed through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right now, as you stand, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, move. I bless you by the God of peace to be sanctified in your thinking, to have your thoughts cleansed where there's been unclean thoughts, where there's been thoughts that of anguish. I bless you to be sanctified in your mind and in your thoughts, that they will be cleansed, that your mind will be pure and set apart for God and His thoughts about you and about your situation right now. Philippians 4, 7, last one. It says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I release over you right now the supernatural peace of God over your mind. Holy Spirit, come right now. I release the supernatural peace of God that transcends all of the worry, all of the circumstances, all of the problems and situations going on in your life right now. The peace of God is bigger and transcends all of those things and it will guard you against the lies of the enemy. It will guard your heart Guard your mind in Christ Jesus. I bless you to receive the transcendent peace of Almighty God, your Father, of your mind today, that you may live this week with peace as your dominant mindset. Peace is the pattern of your thinking. I'm aware today that maybe you haven't invited Christ into your life. Maybe you're here, you haven't done that before.
maybe you've drifted from him and you've moved away. Maybe in your thoughts you've moved away from him and you haven't been in a great place. I want to invite you if you're in either of those categories to join me in a prayer this morning. If you want to receive Christ maybe for the first time, that's just asking God to come into your life, to forgive you of your sin and to receive eternal life and start walking the life he intended for you to have with him. This Father that we've talked about, to have a relationship with Him, I want to invite you to pray a simple prayer to God. Or if you've drifted, to come back. But let's all pray this together. Let's pray, Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. And I thank you for dying for me on the cross and rising again. Forgive me, Jesus, for everything I've ever done wrong and for every wrong thought that I've ever had. Wash me clean. Come into my life. I receive eternal life. I want to walk closely with you. Help me to do this from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just keep your eyes closed. Lord, just bless those ones for that prayer means something. Lord, just bless them right now. Just touch them with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence. Can I just ask prayer ministry folk to come on out the front here? Just come on out the front. If you have any need in your life where you just want more of God or soak in this, or maybe something in the message brought something up for you, come on up and just receive prayer. It's confidential, and we trust these ones who are praying that they will look after you and they will bless your life. So come on up and receive that. This area at the front set apart for ministry. But for the rest of you, you can go enjoy your afternoon. Make sure you grab a cuppa before you leave. There might be some goodies too to munch on. Do that before you go. God bless you. Have a fantastic week.